Good evening to members of the Baltimore Council. I'm Roy Gutman, the new president of the council starting this month. The theme tonight is terrorism and what we have to fear from the Taliban's capture of Kabul last August. It is 20 years after 9-11, 20 years after the US military forced the Taliban from power. And they're back now, and they're running the country again, or at least trying to. Before we begin, one housekeeping hint. That is, after Do Dr. Pillar speaks, we welcome your questions, but please, in the form of questions. Uh, Robbie Harris, the chairman of the Board of Trustees, will handle uh, the questions and asks that you register your interest in the chat function. Uh, write out your question, as he may want to group some of them together. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Pillar, is an intelligence expert extraordinaire, and he's dealt with some of the most vexing problems on the planet, including Afghanistan, terrorism, and Iraq. He's known as a man who always seeks to tell truth to power. Uh, he was one of that core of CIA analysts who were shouting and screaming in the uh, period before 9-11 about the risks uh, of a, an Al-Qaeda attack on U.S. territory. He's also a man who's been critical at times of the politicization of intelligence that occurred in the run-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. That is the arm twisting of analysts into supporting a line of policy. I hope that is not happening again. Uh, in fact, I think what, what we're seeing right now in Ukraine is that intelligence has really served policy and possibly will serve the hopes for an eventual peaceful outcome. Since he retired from the CIA in 2005, after 28 years of service, he has been a faculty member at uh, Georgetown University's uh, Security Studies uh, program and served as the director of graduate studies. He also has been affiliated with some of the leading think tanks in Washington, such as the Brookings Institution. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College, Oxford University, and has been, uh, and he received his PhD from Princeton. Dr. Pillar is uh, one of the people who was most worried about Al-Qaeda in the late 1990s. Uh, it was a time when successive presidents uh, did their best to look the other way, and, and they were really not paying much attention uh, to the analysts. Today, he has a very different message. The problem of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is now on a much smaller scale. I'm sure we'll have questions uh, for him. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored <clears throat> to turn over the microphone to Dr. Pillar. Uh, thanks very much, Roy, for the for the generous introduction. Um, we I've, I've been asked to address specifically terrorism as it relates to Afghanistan in the wake of the U.S. withdrawal, and you got a little bit of where I'm coming from on that, having worked on counterterrorism through most of the 1990s as an intelligence officer. There are a couple of strong tendencies in the way Americans tend to approach this topic which aren't always helpful in understanding it. One is a conflation of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that is to say the events of last August, with the larger question of the wisdom of staying or leaving and what was or was not uh, you know, accomplished in the 20 years that we were there. The other tendency stems from the understandable national trauma of 9-11 more than 20 years ago, and that is to strongly associate Afghanistan in American minds with terrorism. And that association, I would argue, overlooks a couple of realities about international terrorism. One concerns the role of physical territory, a group having control over or being able to use without impediments some piece of real estate. We have a strong tendency to think in such spatial terms about counterterrorism, especially uh, given the use of a metaphor like war on terror, suggesting an ability to follow the progress of that war the same way we might follow uh, the progress of a conventional war, uh, 
uh, looking at front lines on a map, just as we today are looking at maps in the newspaper to follow the front lines of the war in, in uh, Ukraine. But if you look at the ingredients of any terrorist group's ability to conduct international terrorist operations, especially the variety that we Americans are most concerned with, that is to say attacks on the United States, then a piece of some real estate, a physical haven, is actually not one of the more important ingredients. And the 9-11 operation itself is an example. Much of the preparation took place outside Afghanistan in places like Germany and Spain and not, not least of all flight schools here in the United States. Uh, and in addition to that, in cyberspace. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of the operation when he was actually managing and directing it, could have been basically anywhere because he was using electronic means to, uh, to direct the operation. A group such as Al-Qaeda certainly has made use of real estate when it has had access to it. Uh, it's, you know, it's come into ha handy in, uh, in, in terms of training and parts of the recruitment process. Uh, but the skills and the capabilities developed are not necessarily the ones that are most important as far as international terrorist operations are concerned. In the case of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, the group was participating in an Afghan civil war on the side of the Taliban, and so it, it used um, skills that were relevant to an insurgency um, or a civil war in, in more conventional uh, ways. A useful point of reference on this topic, I think, is the history over the last decade of another group, namely ISIS, the so-called Islamic State which acquired, as you recall, back in a, at its peak around 2014, territorial control to such an extent that it had, in effect, its own mini-state uh, that comprised large parts of western Iraq and eastern Syria. Now, the threat posed by ISIS as an international terrorist group has not correlated with it, the extent of its territorial control, and if anything, it's tended to be the opposite. When it had that mini-state, its first concern was to maintain that accomplishment, to make the trains run on time, so to speak, in its so-called caliphate. And its message at the time to would-be followers overseas was not to conduct a lot of terrorist operations overseas, but rather to come here, join us in the caliphate, and help, help us make it strong. It was only uh, after the caliphate that mini-state was reduced and it doesn't exist anymore, that ISIS uh, had gone more to being a conventional international terrorist group, one that uh, does call for operations overseas. Another reality concerns Afghanistan specifically, and whether to the extent that access to real estate matters at all, there is something special about that one country. Afghanistan's role in international terrorism was basically a historical accident having to do with the attempt by the USSR to prop up a communist regime in Afghanistan that had come under fire from an insurgency in the 1970s, leading to the Soviets' 10-year military intervention from 1979 to 1989. And during that period, the war there became a prominent jihad for foreigners of the violent jihadist persuasion. Now, it's the, by no means the only place that has served that function. We've had others, Bosnia, Chechnya, and more recently, the civil war in Syria. Uh, but Afghanistan certainly was a, a, a formative experience for many foreign jihadists. It became the campsite for bin Laden after his own sojourn in Sudan, which followed his break with, his, with the regime in his homeland, Saudi Arabia. Then after the Soviets gave up, basically, and uh, left in Afghanistan in 1989, we had a complex history which included their client Najibullah regime, which hang on, hung on for another, another three years before it finally fell. And then the warlords that toppled it fell out among themselves violently until the Pakistani-supported Taliban swept in, swept most of the warlords away, and took control of most, though not all, of Afghanistan. And then, several years later, after 9-11, we had Operation Enduring Freedom, our intervention, and the history that we've become more familiar with over the last 20 years.
Now, at the present point in Afghanistan's history, with the Taliban being the government over almost all of Afghanistan, there are not the same ingredients for that history that I've just re recapitulated to repeat itself. The rulers of Afghanistan, the Taliban, are hardcore Islamists themselves. And their most troublesome op opposition at the moment uh, is another batch of hardcore Islamists, namely the local branch of ISIS. So would-be foreign jihadists are not presented with an attractive cause as they were back in the 1980s of fighting for Islam against infidels. But most pertinent to the subject of potential terrorist havens is that Afghanistan is simply not unique. There are plenty of other places around the world for terrorists to pitch a tent if they really have to, in areas that have either exploitable lawlessness, like Somalia, for example, or local powers that might be at least partly sympathetic to their aims and with whom deals can be struck. The real estate that's been associated with the closest that any terrorist of the Al-Qaeda ilk came since 9-11 to mounting a successful terrorist operation that would kill Americans uh, was Yemen. Uh, I'm referring back to a couple of the uh, abortive operations. You may recall Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, and then there was another operation that involved uh, sending toner cartridges that were laden with explosives. Uh, that, was, that was all coming out of Yemen, not Afghanistan. So there's a legitimate question to be asked if we get beyond the understandable traumatic memories associated with 9-11 of why there ought to be any singular focus on Afghanistan when it comes to this form of anti-U.S. threat. The Afghan Taliban are not themselves international terrorists. They are a highly insular bunch. They are overwhelmingly concerned with political power inside Afghanistan and with the social and political order in Afghanistan. That insularity is perhaps reflected in the relative paucity of Afghan nationals in jihads and some of those other places I mentioned, like Chechnya and Bosnia, in contrast to the far greater numbers of Egyptians and Saudis and Pakistanis and Emiratis and Jordanians and many others who have participated in those conflicts. Back in the years immediately before 9-11, the Taliban did have an alliance with bin Laden's group. It valued that alliance because it was able to add some fighting power in the ongoing Afghan civil war. The Taliban needed it. They were fighting against what was known as the Northern Alliance, a mostly Tajik-dominated uh, set of oppositionists, uh, whose leading most famous commander was Ahmad Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir. And the Northern Alliance still controlled roughly about a quarter of Afghanistan in the north, with the Taliban controlling the other three quarters. There certainly was ideological compatibility with bin Laden, but the arrangement was still largely transactional. Bin Laden's strategy of hitting the far enemy, namely us, as a way of getting at his near enemies, especially the Saudi regime, was totally foreign to the Taliban's own interests and objectives, which are very much, as I said, centered inside Afghanistan. The key point in the Taliban's history with regard to shaping their current and future behavior came with 9-11 and the U.S. response to it. That was the biggest setback by far that the Taliban have ever suffered. They were ousted from power over most of Afghanistan, and it then took them 20 years to undo that damage to their cause and to get to where they are today. They have every incentive not to let that sort of thing happen again. Often the question is raised about whether the Taliban would break ties or end the relationship with al-Qaeda, but I think that's the wrong way to think about it. There is a relationship, there will continue to be a relationship, uh, which is ba based partly on family ties and marital ties. The question is in what direction the Taliban would exercise whatever influence they have through that relationship on what is left of al-Qaeda. The key variable in that regard is to what extent civil war in Afghanistan flares up 
with new armed challenges to the Taliban. Or conversely, the Taliban is able to bring greater stability to the country and to its rule. The main circumstance that would give the Taliban the incentive to reactivate something like the alliance it had with al-Qaeda back in the 1990s would be a heated up Afghan civil war that would once again increase the Taliban's appetite for assistance in that fight, the kind of assistance they needed and that al-Qaeda helped to render back in the 1990s. Possibly even assuming a risk about what those providing the assistance might do outside Afghanistan's borders, the kind of thing that happened back in 2001. To the extent, conversely, that the Taliban can consolidate their rule, then that historical lesson I mentioned uh, will, will be paramount. They won't want to repeat the experience of 2001. There are some obvious implications for what I just said for the policies of foreign states, including the United States, with regard to any further fighting in Afghanistan. We actually share an interest with the Taliban in dealing with ISIS-K, the uh, local affiliate of Islamic State. I'm not suggesting that there's going to be any kind of formal liaison relationship anytime soon with the Taliban, certainly not when you have someone like uh, one of the Haqqanis as the interior minister of the Taliban regime. But we've had experience in making common cause with some pretty unsavory characters because we shared a common <clears throat> counter-terrorist adversary. <clears throat> I'd recall some from, from my own experience uh, looking at another uh, unsavory bunch of characters that we had some cooperation with, and that was Libya under Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, I was, uh, had the privilege of being part of the initial round of what were then highly secret negotiations, which started under the Clinton administration back in 1999, um, not so much negotiations, but talks, uh, with Gaddafi's regime. This was after he coughed up the two suspects that were wanted for the Pan Am 103 bombing, and he came to the U U.S. government through an intermediary and said, let's talk. We share some of these concerns with some of these radical Islamist groups, which were going after his regime, as well as being very much anti-U.S. and anti-Western. Uh, and part of my mission in for those first couple of rounds of talks was to assess whether the Libyans were serious about this, and my assessment was, indeed, they were. And after some fits and starts and four more years of talks, uh, an agreement was reached in 2003 among the U.S., the U.K., and, and Gaddafi's regime, which resulted in him uh, not only giving up and opening up his unconventional we weapons programs, but also really coming over to the good side as far as terrorism is concerned and becoming part of the solution and no longer part of the, uh, the problem. Counterterrorism, as that episode illustrates, is an area where cooperation with other governments, with other regimes, is perhaps the last to fall on the, in the wayside, despite what may be very serious political or ideological differences on other issues. Now, comparing the implications for possible international terrorism between an Afghanistan with U.S. troops there and one without, I think we need to bear in mind you know, what was not accomplished in that 20-year involvement, as reflected in the fact that we're still talking about something like a Taliban-Al-Qaeda relationship. And that's not to mention you know, the, the fragility of what there obviously was with regard to the previous Afghan regime, as reflected in how quickly it collapsed. At least as important is to be conscious of how a U.S. military presence in such a place can counterproductively increase the chance of Americans falling victim to terrorism. In this respect, I would recall two incidents that occurred back in those closing days of the withdrawal last August. One of them was the suicide bombing that was carried out by Islamic State outside the Kabul airport, which killed, in addition to Afghans, 13 of our own U.S. service members. Uh, <clears throat> that was an attack that was aimed in the first instance against, um, against the Taliban rule and to try to demonstrate that they did not have control of the place. But it also was a twofer from the standpoint of uh, Islamic State in attacking the U.S. 
and they were exploiting the fact that U.S. forces in Afghanistan had come to be seen by many Afghans and those who sympathized with them as occupiers, more so than as liberators or stabilizers. And there certainly has been academic research, especially by Robert Pape at the University of Chicago, that has looked more generally at, uh, in, well, in Pape's case, specifically at suicide terrorism in various countries, and has reached the conclusion that the, the one factor that is most likely to stimulate it is foreign occupation and resentment over that foreign occupation, military occupation. The other incident from last August, you may remember, was uh, the killing of 10 innocent Afghan civilians, including seven children, by a missile fired from a U.S. drone. An unfortunate incident that exemplifies the kind of harm that has been inflicted all too often in the so-called war on terror, either because of mistaken identification, which was true in this particular tragic case, or in some other instances, seemingly unavoidable collateral damage from operations that are aimed at legitimate terrorist targets. The military operations, including Afghanistan, may have bred in some instances at least as many anti-U.S. terrorists through the anger and desire for revenge that such operations often incite as they have eliminated. Finally, I'd like to say a few things about intelligence collection. This topic uh, came up quite a bit in connection with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, over at the CIA, Director Burns uh, stated way back last April, uh, you know, a few months before the withdrawal, uh, that yes, intelligence collection in Afghanistan would be harder uh, when we don't have the presence that we uh, used to have then and don't have now. But for all the reasons that I mentioned, I would suggest that intelligence reporting emanating from Afghanistan probably will not be the make or break difference in avoiding a terrorist attack that will kill Americans, and especially a, a terrorist attack here in the United States. Now, Afghanistan is still going to be and still is a very important intelligence target for various reasons, and I have no doubt that the intelligence agencies are devoting a lot of attention to it today. I might add this possibly could be an argument uh, to have a diplomatic mission there, at least as much as it would be an argument to have a military presence, given that, especially with human intelligence collection, our diplomatic posts overseas have most often been the uh, platforms from which such operations for intelligence collection have been run. But we can also use other on-the-ground assets, as well as remote sensing. And I would compare the situation today with uh, what we knew about bin Laden and his group back in the 1990s, in those last few years before the 9-11 operation. By the mid to late 1990s, we had bin Laden in our sights, based on both uh, the kind of remote capabilities I mentioned, as well as on the ground ones. Uh, we knew where he was. It was a place called Tarnak Farm. But there were not the political circumstances back here in the United States that would have supported anything like a war, like Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, most Americans would would have preferred to continue to forget about this uh, country thousands of miles away. The U.S. did come very, very close to uh, getting bin Laden in the cruise missile strike that the Clinton administration ordered in 1998 in response to the al-Qaeda uh, perpetrated bombings of two of our embassies in Africa, in Kenya and, and Tanzania. Uh, he was missed by just uh, an hour or so. Now, the situation would be far different today if anything like what was existed back in the late 1990s, with bin Laden and his group having a compound and them having an active relationship with the Taliban, if anything like that was recreated, well, today the gloves are off. There wouldn't be the political hesitation. 
um, to use um, missiles or whatever to, uh, to get at them in a way we were hesitant to do as a country back, uh, back in the 1990s. Well, finally, just one last thing concerning intelligence. I may refer to a Department of Defense uh, Inspector General report that was made public just last month and that referred to some intelligence judgments coming out of uh, U.S. Central Command as well as the Defense Intelligence Agency that are pertinent to some of the things I just talked about. Um, this report mentioned uh, uh, the status of ISIS K, uh, and that it was that that group is focused, uh, just like the Taliban itself is, on power and position inside Afghanistan, and at least for the moment is not uh, focused on trying to do any operations overseas. It further judged that uh, ISIS K is exploiting uh, some of the discontent. Uh, among Afghan civilians that the Taliban have generated because of some of their some of their methods of governance that are objectionable to Afghans just as much as they are to us. And the report also talked about that relationship between the Taliban and what is now left of Al-Qaeda uh, and that there is indeed a relationship and that some of the senior members in the Taliban regime are people who have some of these personal and other ties to Al-Qaeda, but it also said basically what I said a few minutes ago, that from Al Taliban's point of view, their main uh, objective is to keep a leash on Al-Qaeda's operations uh, so that they don't have anything like a repeat of the events of 2001. Well, Roy, let me stop there, and I look forward to uh, questions. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for I, I, just a, an outstanding uh, and most informative uh, briefing tonight. Uh, you touched on this in the last few minutes of your briefing, but I think it's important enough to, to sort of, if you would, uh, foot stomp on. That there was so much uh, discussion leading up to the withdrawal from Afghanistan and after the withdrawal from Afghanistan about, oh my goodness, how awful it's going to be to conduct over the horizon any tail coalition. You discussed this a bit, but I'd like to return to it because I think it's important enough uh, to make this clear. And I think my understanding of what you have said both before and again tonight that you are not you are not terribly concerned or worried about the difficulty of collecting intelligence, given the fact that we are not on the ground in Afghanistan the way we had been before August of last year. Is that correct? Well, look, it, of course it's worth worrying about, and I have no doubt that Director Burns and others in the intelligence community are worrying about it. That's part of their job. Um, you know, we always have trade-offs in, well, we usually have trade-offs in these difficult situations between what would make intelligence collection the easiest on one hand and all of the other uh, political sensitivities and, and constraints that may be, uh, from the intelligence officer's point of view, handicaps. And you know, the intelligence agencies are never going to have a perfect world in which everything defers to them and their needs. Uh, notwithstanding those other uh, political objectives, foreign policy considerations, and sensitivities. Uh, so I, I have no doubt that uh, especially those who are in the uh, clandestine human collection business, um, they, they, you know, they would say, you know, the more presence we have, the better. Uh, but there are always going to be trade-offs, and, and my judgment is, in terms of, the, as I tried to put it earlier, in terms of the things that we most need to worry about, and especially we're talking about terrorism, that concern that uh, so many Americans shared whenever Afghanistan comes up, uh, that it is not, um, you know, the, the, the downgrading of the capabilities that really matter uh, is not uh, of such an extent that uh, I, would, I could come up with a justification for saying uh, we need to defer to the intelligence agencies on this and notwithstanding other reasons uh, you know, why it would make sense to have gotten out of Afghanistan. We should still be there just because we need to collect the information. I simply don't see that as, as the, um, you know, as an appropriate weighing of priorities. And, and I would couple that again with a reference to, to other capabilities, 
um, of the, the, both the remo remote and more immediate sort, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, ways of, of dealing with sources that are on the ground, even if you don't have a U.S. officer handling them uh, on, on the spot, uh, that should be sufficient to, to meet uh, most of our intelligence needs that really matter as it relates to Afghanistan and as it relates specifically to terrorism that could emanate out of Afghanistan. We have a question on the chat from Bruce, and Bruce's question is this. Should we do more to help the Afghan people? Well, there's, there are lots of you know, humanitarian stories that we've been reading about in the papers um, that we, well, we're, we're, we're reading about them less because there's a bigger, more immediate humanitarian story in Ukraine right now. Uh, my short answer would be yes. Um, now, the trade-off there, and there was a lot written about this uh, in the press and commentary in the weeks immediately following the withdrawal in, in uh, August of last year, how do you do something like provide aid that is intended to help the Afghan people without, in essence, propping up this <clears throat> regime, the Taliban, that we have certainly no desire to, to prop up or to help? Uh, there are ways to get around that. Uh, there are you know, NGOs um, uh, that can be the conduit for a lot of uh, ways to help the Afghan people that don't really build up the regime at all. Um, but there, there will be even ways in which it uh, would entail working to some extent with the regime without necessarily, uh, you know, strengthening it. You're de facto recognizing it, even though we don't formally diplomatically recognize the Taliban. Uh, but my short answer is yes. Uh, uh, there are enormous needs of a humanitarian sort and a more general economic sort uh, that would uh, justify additional assistance. Paul, oh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes from our president, uh, Roy Gutman. And this is Roy's uh, uh, question. He says, about the fact that terrorists almost always seek territory in order to train, organize, and operate, then Taliban hosted numerous groups from Chechnya, China, Pakistan, etc. Can they really keep, can they really be kept out? Over to you, Paul. I'm sorry, well, it was kept, kept out of, of where, you out of Afghanistan? Or? I think that's what you were asking, yes. there, Roy. Uh, yes, exactly, because, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they fought there before. They supported uh, the Taliban in their internal battles. Uh, there's an IOU that they can collect in the situation like that, and it's very hard to imagine... Uh, you know, the relationships that were forged uh, during that war disappearing. And in fact, it, it seems to me that it likely that these other terror groups from all over the region uh, and well beyond uh, are likely to uh, to want to come back and collect their IOU. And uh, so far, what the Taliban has done in, in its early days was to release uh, some uh, terrorists from jail. Uh, they, they've allowed uh, al-Qaeda to continue functioning, as we know, and ISIS is there in big numbers. Uh, the Pakistani Taliban is sort of waiting to uh, revive. Uh, you know, once you have territory, um, especially if you're an extremist uh, Islamic group, is it, how, how do you actually uh, keep, keep these worse actors uh, out of your territory? Well, it's going to be basically impossible for the Taliban or anyone else to, to keep them out. I think we do have to go back to what the incentives are. Um, you know, as I tried to paint the picture before, you know, the main, the main contest going on right now in Afghanistan is a bunch of radical Islamists against a bunch of other radical Islamists. That is to say, the Taliban against ISIS-K. So if you are yourself a radical jihadist type, um, you know, who do, who do you fight for? Well, you know, there are various reasons which are part of the uh, larger uh, competition over the last few years between ISIS and Al-Qaeda for kind of overall leadership of the, the global jihadist movement, if you can call it that, although that implies, you know, more organization and coherence than it really has. But it's not anything like when you had the Soviets there. Um, and... You know, for a radical jihadist, it was clear who and what his, in his eyes the good guys were and who the bad guys were. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, uh, 
uh, you know, what most of them would want to do there. Uh, if you do, uh, I mean, I, I think what you're saying, Roy, is that based on old relationships with the Taliban specifically, which predated before we even had an ISIS, uh, that, you know, that would be a motivation to help, help ISIS, help the Taliban out, which may well be the case, but I mean, right now, uh, they would be helping them to fight somebody like ISIS. And for those of us on the outside, I think, you know, the appropriate, uh, maybe not the appropriate, but the natural reaction would be, you know, a plague on both your houses. Uh, and the Taliban, meanwhile, uh, the Taliban regime uh, does not have an interest in any other other group, regardless of their ideology, whether it's ISIS-K or, or some other batch of comparably radical types uh, operating independently or semi-independently in this country over the whole of which the Taliban wants to exert control. Um, so they, they will continue to try to resist that, but in terms of keeping them out, I don't, I don't think they really have any way of keeping them out. Paul, oh, thank you very much. Um, another question uh, comes from uh, Mr. Cohen, and it, it goes like this. He, he writes, I recall back in 1998, there were Al Qaeda sympathizers in Pakistan, in the Pakistan command. Are there still ship columnists in the high echelons of the Pakistan military? Paul, over you. Well, my guess is the answer is yes. And uh, besides events back in 1998, uh, you may recall the more recent events when we had the raid under the Obama administration at Abbottabad, Pakistan, which is the one in which bin Laden was killed. You know, this took place at a location that was uh, uh, not far away from, you know, major installations of the Pakistani army, and a lot of people were scratching their heads and wondering quite reasonably, uh, how could bin Laden have been holed up at this place for so long and the Pakistani military, or at least some of it, were not aware of that. I think that's a very uh, good question to ask. I think it does indicate that uh, uh, there were sympathizers in the high echelons of the Pakistani military, not just in 90, 1998, but uh, uh, much later as well. Now, I, I, would, I think I would just add, uh, we've got the further question uh, of particular importance right now of the continued relationship between the Pakistani regime and the Afghan Taliban. Uh, you know, when, when the when the well, the events of last August uh, with the Afghan Taliban coming into Kabul were uh, greatly welcomed by Pakistani decision makers. You know, these were their guys, and had been their guys ever since the Taliban was really kind of put together back in the they were put together in the 1990s and the kind of movement that they became. Um, since then, though, and I'm just talking about, you know, the last, the last few months, uh, since the events of August, I think the Pakistani regime has had, uh, some people have put it, you know, a, 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 a brutal, uh, confrontation with some reality in that, uh, although the Pakistanis might have expected that the Afghan Taliban would be very, uh, cooperative in securing the long common border, and preventing any action based in Afghanistan from causing trouble in Pakistan, that does not seem to be the case. Um, the, what's often referred to as the Pakistani Taliban, or the TTP, a ideologically similar group, although it's basically a separate group, that has been responsible for much of the violence in northwestern Pakistan, um, if anything, their, their operations have picked up in tempo some over these last few months. It appears that, uh, speaking of returning favors, the Afghan Taliban are returning some favors to the TTP in terms of permitting or at least turning a blind eye toward uh, cross-border operations in the same way that their Pakistani brethren help them with their own cross-border operations uh, when the Afghan Taliban were still um, trying to expand their power. What all this means in terms of hard choices uh, that the Pakistani government will have to take uh, and, and the Pakistani military, not just the civilian leadership and Prime Minister Khan, uh, remains to be seen. But uh, this Pakistani uh, dynamic has been you know, the single biggest uh, external factor in this whole Afghanistan 
terrorism story, and it continues to be so today. Well, a, a related question uh, concerning Pakistan is how, how confident are you, how comfortable are you that the Pakistani government has control over its nukes? I, I'm pretty comfortable about that. It's obviously a high priority for them as well as for us. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you know we've we've given them some friendly advice with regard to control of that sort of thing. Um, it really would be worst casing the the uh, a prognosis for Pakistan as a whole. That is to say, the, the the regime, including the Pakistani military, basically collapses and and something much more radical and different comes to power uh, in Islamabad, th then, then obviously it's a huge worry. But I don't see any signs of that uh, being liable to happen anytime soon, uh, as long as we have the basically the current power structure uh, with the military basically in charge, then I'm, I'm not too worried about the control of the nukes. We, we were quite concerned about how quickly uh, the Afghanistan government collapsed world. Uh, but that's, that's, that's another question. Well, that, I, 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 don't, I don't think we can compare the regime, uh, the government of Ashraf Ghani, uh, with the Pakistani military. I, I think we're, we're talking about um, apples and oranges or, or apples and blueberries uh, in that kind of comparison. I'm glad you said that. Uh, here, here is a question from Bruce. And unfortunately, I don't know Bruce's last name. Uh, it goes like this. Do you think that the way we withdrew from Afghanistan is pushing the Saudis towards a closer relationship with China, and should we do something about it? I, I don't think, no, I don't think the way we withdrew uh, really has much uh, to do with that. Uh, you know, the fact of the withdrawal, uh, well, that we can have a different debate about. You know, there's been an awful lot of commentary, certainly since last August, to the effect that, well, the withdrawal, uh, you know, it shows, you know, America pulling in its horns, retreating, uh, playing less of a role. And this means a lot of uh, actors who have been more or less uh, clients or partners of ours are looking in other directions. And the Saudis are the ones who immediately come to mind as, as a prime example of that. <laughs> I think that that overstates... Uh, the, that particular dynamic. Uh, moreover, uh, it, it begs the question of to what extent, if the United States were still saddled, I think that's the right word, with prosecuting a war without any apparent end in Afghanistan. I, after all, we had we're already there for 20 years before we pulled out. How does that? How should that increase the confidence of the Saudis or anyone else that the United States is going to? Uh, you know, back up their own security. I, 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 don't, I don't see it as increasing that at all. As far as the Saudis right now are concerned, um, they, they probably look more to uh, current U.S. policy as it relates to Iran and the Persian Gulf, you know, their immediate neighborhood. Uh, the Saudis, of course, are unhappy about any kind of rapprochement or agreements we reach uh, with the Iranians, uh, which we may be on the cusp of in terms of reinstating the nuclear agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And uh, that, that, that leads them to understand that, uh, you know, Uncle Sam is not always going to be there um, uh, to, to give a high priority to their own immediate security objectives, which are, are very much different from ours. So I, I don't think the, the, the Afghanistan events um, have had a big effect on that in terms of Saudi-Chinese relations. And we, you know, we should go go back in history some. <laughs> you know, that, that relationship has been around for a long time. You know, the, uh, the first big uh, uh, influx of ballistic missiles that really mattered was when the Saudis uh, secretly purchased uh, a bunch of missiles from China way back in, I think it was around 1983. Um, so when you talk about missile proliferation in the Middle East, a subject that often comes up with regard to Iran and others, uh, we ought to remember that uh, this isn't anything recent. And by the way, the Saudis and Chinese were doing that stuff uh, almost four decades ago. Paul, well, thank you very much. Um, another question bearing on Afghanistan in August of, of last year. Uh, there have been uh, several, several articles um, across several publications uh, 
uh, which have compared the, the way we did not share intelligence information with our allies prior to August of uh, last year regarding Afghanistan. And that is compared with the way uh, the U.S. government apparently has shared intelligence information very widely and openly, I read, with our allies regarding Ukraine. Um, is that the way you see it? Do you see a, a big difference between the way the U.S. shared intelligence prior to August of last year and the way we have shared intelligence with allies and partners leading up to Afghanistan and throughout uh, over to Afghanistan, uh, correction, uh, Ukraine over the past uh, three or four weeks? I don't see the situations as comparable at all. I mean, first of all, you have to ask, what kind of intelligence are you talking about? In the case of Ukraine, we evidently, we and the British had uh, very good intelligence about not only the, the Russian military preparations and movements, but apparently uh, things having to do with intentions and what, what uh, <clears throat> Putin was really up to. Uh, I, I don't know what, <laughs> what would be comparable in Afghanistan. Uh, we're talking about there, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the kind of sudden uh, collapse type events, which are not part of anyone's uh, war plan. Uh, you know, we knew the Afghanistan Taliban, you know, has been trying for 20 years to try to take over the whole place. Uh, that's, that's no, you know, intelligence uh, acquisition just over the last year or in months or weeks prior to August. And as far as how the events of August last year actually played out, that's, uh, again, it's no one's plan. It's basically unpredictable. You can make assessments of what's more likely or less likely. Uh, but that's much different uh, from getting the kind of information we apparently got uh, <clears throat> about uh, the Russian objectives and Putin's objectives uh, in Ukraine. And that sharing, uh, you know, in Ukraine had the very specific purpose uh, of trying to throw Putin and his regime off balance to uh, preemptively, um, uh, you know, spoil uh, whatever specific plans they had about false flag operations as a justification for going into Ukraine, that sort of thing. Again, there's, there's no comparison with what I saw in Afghanistan. So, so I, I think it's really two different things. So it's an apples and oranges comparison. I, I, I got that. Do do you do you agree that the the way we meaning the U.S. have shared intelligence with uh, NATO and other other allies leading up to the events in Ukraine um, that it is unprecedented? Is that an exaggeration or not? Well, I wouldn't quite say unprecedented. It was certainly very aggressive. Um, you know, we can we can find past instances of selective uh, disclosures uh, for specific uh, diplomatic purposes. Uh, I think this probably uh, was, was a more extensive use of it. I think it was a very appropriate use. It did not, in the end, prevent the invasion. Uh, but I think it, it did probably throw the Russians off balance. It probably did screw up some of their plans for things like false flag operations and trying to, trying to justify uh, their invasion. Uh, I was struck, uh, you know, by the certainty with which, you know, President Biden himself uh, was was saying, you know, they're going to invade and they're going to invade in the next week. I, I was getting a little nervous about that because uh, it would really open uh, the administration up to a cry wolf kind of phenomenon if uh, the invasion did not occur. But uh, it turns out, you know, whatever they were acting on in terms of that intelligence was uh, was pretty good stuff. Um, thank you very much. I think I have pretty much exhausted the questions or comments in the chat feature. Uh, Roy Gutman, do you have anything else? Uh, well, yes, I wanted to ask you, coming back to the uh, my opening remarks, do you think that there is any carryover from the chaotic withdrawal of the American uh, forces from Kabul uh, that it may in, in, in any way have encouraged uh, Vladimir Putin to send his army into Ukraine, thinking that the West is disorganized, the U.S. Is, can't manage a withdrawal, and, um, and they really don't care very much about the rest of the world. Uh, I doubt it very much for two basic reasons, Roy. One is the one I alluded to in responding to the question about the Saudis and Chinese, and that is I don't see how it would be more encouraging for Putin to uh, try to do what he's doing in Ukraine um, if the United States was not 
bogged down in Afghanistan uh, than if it were bogged down in Afghanistan. Uh, I, you know, I don't see the continued continuation of the U.S. presence there um, as uh, uh, as an asset when it comes to trying to persuade the likes of Putin that we would uh, stand up tall and strong if we were to try to do something in Ukraine. And again, I would uh, I would draw the distinction between you, you say you know how the withdrawal took place, and now I'm referring to the fact of the withdrawal. Uh, we, you know, we, it would take more time to probably argue about this question, but uh, I would contend that uh, if we were going to get out of Afghanistan at all, um, and I, I do believe that the president made the right decision on that, that the end was going to look messy in some ways. You, you can, with, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, you can go back and say, well, we should have done this, should have done that. But given the nature of the collapse and the rapidity of the collapse of, of the Ghani government, uh, it's hard to say that there was something to build on there that would have um, made possible a much less messy uh, withdrawal. But that's one basic reason. The other basic reason, and there's been so much commentary about this since uh, since the Russian invasion began, is that it has to do with Putin's uh, long-term ambitions and intentions and objectives uh, focused on you know trying to uh, restore greater Russia and all that. I mean, that, that really has nothing whatever to do with, um, you know, what the United States was doing in Afghanistan. This has to do with his worldview and his ambitions and his megalomania. And I, I, I don't see as that as being uh, divertible, even if we somehow changed our own policy in Afghanistan. You make a good point. Uh, I, I do have one other broad question if I can throw that at you, sure. which is that uh, we're in an age now of uh, great power competition again. Uh, obviously, the Russians are on the, on the make, but the Chinese as well. Uh, does this give an opportunity, as, as, as a terrorism expert, counterterrorism expert, does this give any, oppor any opportunity to terror groups to grow and to play one uh, superpower or one power off against another? I don't think so. If we avoid the mistake of <clears throat> trying to subordinate counterterrorism to every other difference we may have with great powers, you know, I alluded to this briefly in talking about the living experience, how even when we have very serious political and other dif uh, differences with some other regime, um, if we share a counterterrorist concern, um, there's still an opportunity for cooperation. And Back during the time when I was uh, uh, working on counterterrorism uh, as the chief of the analytic side of the, the counterterrorist center at the CIA and later as deputy chief of the center, some of the, not just the, the, the Libyans that I mentioned, but some of the other uh, counterparts that I sat down with across a liaison table, you might be surprised at, at who some of them were in terms of being from regimes that we much more consider adversaries rather than friends. Uh, you know, that would include the likes of the Russians and Chinese. Although I would have to qualify that by saying, given the current situation <clears throat> with regard to Ukraine, I imagine that as far as cooperation with the Russians are concerned, even counterterrorism is something that perhaps at least temporarily has fallen by the wayside. <clears throat> Although I hasten to note that uh, when it comes to uh, uh, activities in space, we still are working with the Russians in keeping the International Space Station going, although maybe that's because we actually have, we both have people up there in orbit who need to be kept safe. So uh, my, my response is, uh, yeah, if, if, we, if we don't cooperate with uh, other great powers <clears throat> to pursue common counter-terrorist concerns, and yes, there is, there's an opportunity for uh, terrorist groups uh, <clears throat> to, to drive wedges between us, just like other regimes might. Uh, but if we play our cards right, um, and if, if other regimes like the Russians and Chinese or others are realist enough about counterterrorism, then I, then I don't think that needs to happen. I know we're getting very, very close to our revolution hour, Paul, but two questions just popped up on chat. And uh, perhaps you can give us a, uh, a, a quick answer. The first one uh, is from Mark Sol uh, Solomon, one of our uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, Mark asked this question. Do we still need 17-plus separate intelligence agencies, or is it time to tear down? 
Well, we have, we have all those agencies mainly because they are parts of different departments that serve different purposes or they have different functions. Uh, you know, you have something like the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the State Department, and if I were the Secretary of State, I would certainly want my own intelligence arm and not to be solely, you know, dependent on the CIA or somebody else outside the Department of State to serve my intelligence needs. So that's why they exist, even though once they exist, um, then they are part of this thing we call the intelligence community, and they participate in community-wide things like uh, you know, community-wide intelligence estimates and so on. Then you have the, the functional divisions of, of other agencies, several of which are all within the Department of Defense. You know, NSA does signals intelligence, NGA does overhead imagery, and, and the NRO does you know, launching satellites, all that sort of thing. Uh, it, yeah, it does look kind of cumbersome. It's not necessarily the way we would have designed it by scratch, but uh, from scratch. But I think it, there actually is a logic to it. Paul, the, the last question is from uh, Ms. Hare. Uh, she says, can you say more about your statement that U.S. military presence in other countries increases chances of terrorism? Well, I, di I didn't want to make that a, a generalization. Uh, let me, let me try to refine it a bit more. You know, military force is one of our counterterrorist tools. Uh, it can be very effective in certain ways when you have uh, good military targets to go after, whether it's, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda compound someplace or, or whatever. But I was just adding to that that especially a long-term military presence that comes to be seen as an occupation can have a counterproductive aspect by generating the kind of resentment that leads some resentful people to make uh, the leap into the very nasty business of terrorism. So we have to consider, as we do with any other counter-terrorist tool, uh, you know, the pluses and the minuses. And I think the military one, simply because of the great impact it has, uh, this is more true of it than a lot of other things like intelligence collection and financial controls. Although even those they, they have trade-offs, too, as I suggested uh, in answering an earlier question about intelligence in Afghanistan. That you can't, um, uh, you're always going to have conflicting priorities. So uh, I didn't mean to say that in general, um, you know, what the U.S. military does in other countries is necessarily on balance uh, increasing the chance for terrorism, but it does in, in certain ways and in certain places and especially with a prolonged presence that's seen as an occupation, it can be counterproductive. Well, I want to be uh, sincerely for a very informative and a really factual presentation. <clears throat> uh, will we all be sleeping uh, better tonight as a result of it? Uh, I doubt it, <laughs> not in this dangerous world. But I think you made a point that a withdrawal from Afghanistan <clears throat> was probably inevitable, unavoidable. <clears throat> um, and you, your other point that the risks uh, and, the, and the threats uh, probably can be managed uh, is a hopeful sign, so in a hopeful note. So we thank you very much. Uh, we, we may want to check out whether this all proves to be the case and to invite you back for, for a repause. But for tonight, I want to thank you uh, sincerely on behalf of the whole council. Thank you, Roy. It was a pleasure.